Hi, it's Maria Burke here, and I'm reading the Ark of Don Rua book, The Portal of Zebulon, today with you, and we're moving on to chapter three. Um, yesterday, we talked about, or we read the part about how Simon and Kerry had left their home uh, and gone on the ship, the Ark of Don Rua, to save the city of Zebulun from the dark powers that are trying to put out the portal light there, while Malachi returns to face the danger in the Swish Tree Forest. Um, I'm going to try and read a chapter a day or thereabouts over the coming weeks. And if you want to read along with me, you could turn on the subtitles on your phone or on your laptop. Uh, but if not, you can just relax and sit back and listen. Chapter three, a prophet and a prince. Malachi left Corkscrew Harbour and quickly returned to the village. The town clock struck two when he arrived at the old cross supply and stores, store and tavern. He knocked on the door. There was no reply. He struck it again, this time with his cipher. Still nobody answered. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a dustbin move slowly across the street. Within seconds, he was beside it. He kicked off the lid. Inside, two bloodshot eyes looked up at him and he recognised Raggy Hugglebuck. I thought I told you to go home, said Malachi, lifting the frumpet up by the collar of his filthy lumber shirt. Why do you persist in destroying the reputation of the good people of the forest with the mischief you get up to in the village? I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, your greatness, said Raggy. Please let me go. He tried to wriggle himself free. What's that smell, said Malachi. It's you, isn't it? You reek of dead fish, but I suppose that's all I can expect from somebody who spends their time scavenging around filthy dustbins. I, I, I'll have a bath straight away, your greatness, if you'll only let me go. A large bead of sweat rolled down Raggy's face, leaving a white furrow in its wake. He wiped his huge red nose with the back of his hand and sniffed. I know I'm a wretch, cried Raggy. But I promise I'll change my ways and I'll be good and I'll never do anything bad again for the rest of my life. First, you must do a job for me. What is it, your greatness? You can break into the supply store for me. Oh, no, your greatness, not the supply store. Mr. Cross will kill me. Good, replied Malachi. You deserve to be killed. Tell Mr. Cross I want him to open the store. This minute. Before I lose my patience, tell him I need some supplies. Malachi carried the wriggling frumpet across the road and lifted him up onto his shoulder. Taking aim, he tossed the little fellow into the air. He sailed through an open window into the top floor of the building. Malachi waited a few moments. Sounds of screaming rose inside the room. Lights came on and an elderly man appeared at the window in his pyjamas. Within seconds, his wife joined him in a pink nightgown. They both looked down at Malachi with their mouths wide open. Do I have to stand here all night waiting for you to open the door, said Malachi. Is it really you, Prophet, said Mr. Cross. Open up, will you? It's getting late. But it's two o'clock in the morning. I don't care, said Malachi. I don't care what time it is. It's high time you were up and about. I need to buy some groceries. Mr. Cross disappeared from the window and soon the lights came on in the shop downstairs. Raggy Hugglebuck appeared at the door and held it open to let Malachi in. Welcome, your greatness, he said, bowing to the prophet. Then he skirted around him and tried to exit the building. Malachi reached back and caught him by the ear. What's that in your pocket, Malachi said. Have you been stealing again? He pulled two packets of cigars out of the frumpet's pocket. Uh, let me have them, argued Mal Raggy. I've had nothing to eat for days. You can't eat cigars, said Malachi, but I love them. They're delicious with mustard. You should try them. My children love them too. Malachi picked up a large turnip from the vegetable counter and stuffed it into the frumpet's hands. Go home this minute and don't come back here. That's an order. But run, 
before I lose my patience. The frumpet scurried down the road and slipped under the shadow of a doorway. Then he ran to the nearest dustbin and jumped into it. Prince Joshua struggled against the Nephilite soldiers as they dragged him high up into the prison tower of Zebulon. There they locked him into a narrow stone cell. He hammered against the stout wooden door, rattling its bars and demanding to be taken back to his dying father's bedside. When finally he realised that the guards were not returning, he collapsed onto his bunk and mourned for the fall of his beautiful city and the lives of his people. Joshua knew that the king of Zebulun would not live much longer. Life was fast slipping away from his tired and sick body. But Joshua remembered how strong he was only a few years before. King Zares was once a man of great power and stature, reigning over his wealthy and peaceful kingdom. Now since the Dark Lord, Antipas, had declared war over Zebulon, all hell was breaking loose. During his long and glorious reign, King Zares claimed that the secret of his wisdom and strength came from the portal of light and power that existed within the palace grounds. From a young age, the king would often come to wake Joshua early in the morning and take him with him to visit the portal. It lay at the heart of the extensive royal estate, deep in the ancient wooded maze. The entrance to the portal rose from the foot of a waterfall and ascended to the rock face behind it. It was a secret place and his father treasured his time there. Beyond the portal gates, Joshua was introduced to another realm. It was a world of light, beauty and splendour beyond the imaginings of the human mind. Joshua believed that this place would always be a safe haven for himself and his father. But now everything had changed. The sound of fighting outside brought Joshua to his feet. He approached his small cell window. Through its bars, he had a good view of the great city built on Lake Gar. The magnificent streets around the citadel were in flames, and in the distance he saw a disturbing sight. Tall ships with black sails were arriving in the harbour. Many of the local white-sailed merchant fleet that battled against them were on fire. Part of the city walls and some of the houses near the banks of Lake Gar had collapsed. Fleets of black ships sailed across the lake on the distant horizon. The Nephilites were even more powerful than he thought. Since the news went out that King Zares was dying, the citizens of Zebulun were consumed with fear of the dark warlord on their border. What they once believed to be an impregnable city full of beauty and light was now defenceless and collapsing into chaos. As he watched, Joshua saw more enemy forces streaming through the great eastern gates. Fighting continued inside the city walls as small bands of local people tried to stop them penetrating the city. With very few weapons and little military training, Joshua realised that the dark powers would soon have his kingdom fully under their control. It was hard to believe that only a few hours before Joshua had been sitting at his father's bedside with his mother, Queen Trewin. Her slender fair looks were typical of the Zebulonian race. The queen wore her long blonde hair tied in an elegant knot behind her head. Her beautiful face looked tired and worried. Joshua bore a close resemblance to his mother, like her son, there was strength and determination in the Queen's light grey eyes. As they were discussing his father's health, there was a knock on the chamber door and a servant entered. Asbel Grender is here to see you. Joshua nodded. Send him in. Joshua's first minister entered the room. Asbel's hair was white, but his youthful face remained clear and unlined. His expression was tense. The Nephilites have breached the city gates, he said. Our forces couldn't hold them off any longer. The few volunteers we have are no match for these giants. We are untrained and have little ammunition, and we couldn't hold them back. Their leader, Antipas, is fast approaching the citadel walls. Can we defend the palace, said Joshua. 
Right now, a team of our ex-soldiers and volunteers are trying to set up some form of defence for the Citadel. I sent them to the armoury to dig out any useful weapons they could find, but there's very little time. The enemy will be upon us soon. Stay here, Mother, said Joshua, and keep watch on Father. Where are you going? To lead our new army. <laughs> You're not a leader, Joshua. You've no training and no experience of war. You could get killed. I need you here with me. You're the heir to the throne. We will lose the throne if somebody doesn't take a stand against Antipas and his army of evil giants. Mother, it's time I take my place as the heir and defend my kingdom. Asbel, come with me. Ignoring the Queen's protest, Joshua made for the chamber door. On the way, he reached out to pull a spear down from an ornamental scabbard that hung on the wall. With Asbel at his side, he descended to the main courtyard and made for the armoury stores. The sound of fighting rose outside. There was banging on the citadel gates and stream, screams rose inside the palace. The gatekeepers came running towards them, shouting, Antipas is here. He has broken through the entrance of the citadel. The sound of fighting rose outside the walls of the great citadel of Zebulon. Screams echoed inside the palace halls as the warlord Antipas and his evil army broke through the main gates. The gatekeepers came running towards Prince Joshua and his first minister, Asbel Grender. The enemy has broken through, they shouted. Did none of you try and stop them, said Joshua. As he spoke, a seven-foot Nephilite with a square-shaped jaw, bearded, appeared at the entrance to the courtyard. He was followed by a raven-haired female and a throng of soldiers. They were dressed in leather uniforms with black mantles draped across their shoulders and they were armed with an array of hybrid weapons. So this must be Prince Joshua, said their leader. Get out of my home, Antipas, said Joshua. My father is on his deathbed. This is not the time to invade my city. It's the perfect time, said Antipas, displaying a row of perfect white teeth over his bearded jaw. If you had any honour, you would let my father die in peace, said Joshua. Leave and take your evil army with you. Stop snivelling, boy, and accept your father's defeat. Joshua reached for his spear and hurled it straight at Antipas. Just as it was about to hit its mark, the raven-haired giantess stepped in front of her leader. She took the blade in her chest. As it sank deep into her flesh, she collapsed onto the ground. The Nephilite guards rallied around her. Commander Dupre has been wounded, they shouted. Stand back, you fools, yelled Antipas. The Nephilite giantess curled both of her hands around the dagger and with great effort extracted it from her flesh. As she struggled to her feet, Antipas raised his hand and struck her hard across the face. She hit the ground again. Blood trickled from her open mouth. Enough of this drama, you foolish woman, he said. Heal yourself. Then he turned to the others. Stop standing around her. Go after the prince. Arrest the boy now. The Nephilite soldiers turned towards Joshua, but he had already bolted in the other direction with Asbel Grender racing after him. Commander Mantessa Dupre wiped the blood from her mouth. She turned her attention to her chest wound. Within seconds, it began to heal. Regaining her usual icy composure, she rose to follow the Nephilite guards who were chasing the young prince and his first minister through the palace grounds. Joshua had a good lead and had almost made it to the armoury stores when he heard Aspel Grender's cry. The young prince turned to see him leaning against an archway, clutching his leg. I've been hit by a missile, said Aspel. Joshua rushed to his side. Leave me, Joshua, said Aspel. Get away and save your own life. The city depends on it. Ignoring his protests, Joshua dragged his first minister down the passage to the armoury. Inside, they found a local group of volunteers grappling with a selection of outdated weapons. 
They had fear written all over their faces. Joshua bolted the door behind him. He ran to the opposite end of the room and started clearing away a pile of armour. Help me, said Joshua. There's a secret escape route under here. It, leans, it leads to the heart of the city. You must gather the people together and tell them to fight. By now, the Nephilite guards had arrived outside the armory door. They tried to batter it down. Joshua and the volunteers quickly found the trap door and prized it open. The volunteers descended a flight of steps beneath it. Asbel stood before Joshua. You go before me, he said. No, I will stay here in the palace with my mother and father, said Joshua. I'll hold the Nephilites off while you escape. Let me stay, said Asbel. I'm an old man. Free yourself. You're in no state to hold them off, said Joshua. They'll soon find this trapdoor and come in pursuit. As your future king, I command you to flee. Set up a new army. Find a way to save the city. By now, the hammering on the door was deafening. It was ready to burst its hinges. Still, Asbel hung back, pleading with Joshua to make his escape. I refuse to leave my dying father, said Joshua. After his death, I will find a way for mother and I to escape. There are husband, there are hundreds of secret tunnels under the citadel, and I know most of them. Now go at once before they capture all of us, and that's an order. Asbel jumped into a tunnel after the others, and Joshua kicked the trapdoor back into place. Just as he replaced the pile of weapons, the armory door fell. Two Nephilites burst through the entrance. Joshua picked up a crossbow and fired at both of them. Wounded, they fell in the doorway. Another Nephilite tried to climb over them. Joshua fired again and brought him down on top of the others. Soon a pile of Nephilites lay blocking the entrance. Joshua held the soldiers back until Commander Mantessa de Prey arrived at the entrance. The Nephilite commander kicked the fallen soldiers aside and picked up the door. She barged her way through the armory, using it as a shield. Her troops surged into the armory and mass behind her. Together, they overpowered the young prince. Restraining him, they bound and dragged him to the prison tower. There, they locked him up. And that's the end of chapter two. We're getting really into the story. Don't forget to subscribe so that you'll know when the next part comes out um, and be sure to comment. Let me know what you think of it, what characters you like, how you think it's going, any changes you'd like to see made. And don't forget as well to share. There could be other people who would like to sit and listen to this and it might help somebody uh, who have their kids home from school and help pass a little bit of time for them. So thank you for joining me today and I'll see you hopefully tomorrow. God bless.